Okay, welcome everybody. Um, welcome to this shiur. This shiur is, this class is a class on tefillah, also known in English as Jewish liturgy. And to give you some background about this class, we began this shiur as a shiur slash podcast for the Moroccan shul in Brooklyn called the Tevot Yisrael Congregation. And we took a we went through almost 200 classes and then we took a hiatus for a couple of months and now the shul asked me to restart the the class and so it with great pleasure we're going to restart everything uh the entire sitter from the beginning um but this time at a hopefully much higher level and i'm very very excited to restart this class now regarding who this class is for this is for uh, people or uh, uh, students or scholars of Jewish liturgy who want to get a head start in um, in their studies of tefillah or their studies of Jewish liturgy, or anybody who finds it interesting. My goal is really to teach tefillah on the highest level. Um, I want both students and scholars or anybody who wants to watch or listen to these shiurim to be um, to be aware of the material available to them. If you're going to if you're going to study Tfila seriously at a high level, I want as many people as possible to be able to um, benefit from these classes. I will be putting these videos on YouTube. So um, I'm not sure if Zoom shows your face, but you know, anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. Um, please don't think this class is going to be too high level or not for you. I'm invested in making it visual. We're going to have slides. Um, and I you know, I if you, I really hope as many people as possible can benefit from the shiur. If you don't read Hebrew or you have no foundational knowledge in Jewish history, then maybe this class is not yet for you, but all are welcome and anybody who wants can join. So let's first begin with the most obvious distinction between the word tefillah and the siddur. Some people will be coming to this class because they want to learn about the siddur or they want to learn about tefillah. And we have to just make a quick distinction between those two terms. First of all, just to begin, sitter, a sitter is a book. It's a manual. It's a type of, um, it is a, a prayer manual, so to speak, for how Jews pray. It is not, the, the sitter is not the prayers. The tefillah is the halachic body of of liturgy, the, the collection of rites or custom rituals that that encompass our daily prayers. So the tefillah is just this body of prayers that we do three times a day on, on regular days and on holidays. The siddur is the manual to do those prayers. This is a very obvious distinction if you're coming from an Orthodox home, this is, or even any Jewish background, this is probably a very obvious distinction to you. However, you have to remember that there was a long time when the tefillah existed without the siddur. And there was a period where Sidurim were not even allowed to be written. There is, let me just admit somebody, there is a famous Gemara in, in Masecha Shabbos, which says that for technical reasons, one cannot um, save a Siddur from a fire on Shabbos. And for this reason, the Gemara uses very strong terminology. It says, Whoever writes Sidurim is like burning Torah. And therefore, for a very long time, this pseudo ban uh, was in was in place and people didn't write Sidurim whatsoever. It wasn't until the uh, the turn of the second century, to, until the um, until the early one thousands, that people started cheating on this rule a little bit and creating Sidurim. So we're not going to immediately. Let me just admit one more person. We're not going to immediately um, speak about the history of the book, the Siddur, but we have these two periods to keep in mind. We have the period when the tefillah developed into the siddur, and then when the siddur developed into a thing which could affect the tefillah itself. So those are the two periods we have to keep in mind. The first period is much harder to understand than the second period. The period where the tefillah shaped the siddur is a lot more work to explore and to understand than understanding from when the printed book came out all the way until the present time. That's a much, uh, that's a much more data-rich um, field to explore. So now the so there are many approaches 
when you start to study tefillah or you start to or you start to study the siddur there are many approaches to um studying to studying tefillah and again tonight i want to graduate i want everybody to to elevate from your elementary or, or high school knowledge of how the siddur works and how tefillah works um i want to go a little bit above that so let's just look at and i hope you could all see this the screen shared on the top let's all look at the number of approaches in which people can study the tefillah the first approach is obviously halacha the halacha, the, the studying from the Gemara down to the Paiskim, down from the Mishnah, the Gemara, the Paiskim, all the way down, the halachic understanding of tefillah is crucial. If one is becoming a rabbi, one wants to lead the prayer, uh, the, one wants to be a prayer leader, or if one wants just to become a Talmud Chacham, understanding the halacha of tefillahs will give you 60% of what you need to know, because most of that information is in the halacha. Most of the information is in the Torah Shulchan Aruch. Most of what you need is there. This is a very important, very powerful way to study tefillah, and most people who are serious about Rabbanus have to uh, start with this, uh, with this mode of study. The next is commentary. Commentary is one which we're not going to have huge emphasis on, but it really does embellish and make studying tefillah so much better, because the commentary really explains the text using Midrashim. It explains the words. It explains the tefillah. It doesn't always get into who wrote the tefillah or the history of the tefillah, but it'll put in ha uh, homiletics. It'll put in... Um, all different kinds of nice explanations. Why did this come before this word? Why did that come before the other word? And it, it, honestly, commentary is really nice. And sometimes it's really, really important. And there's really a place for it. This, this uh, area of study didn't just start with the Paiskim. This area of stu study started with the Rishonim who were invested in commentaries in the uh, 13th centuries and a little bit earlier. So that's an area that we can look at and we are going to look at. The next area is theology. Um, studying the philosophy of religion and exploring how it is, what tefillah is, why why we pray, how we pray in, on a theological level, exploring that philosophy is important because it gives you an eye and a lens into the thoughts of the people who compose the prayer and to the different generations of, um, of prayer composition. When you go many periods back, you're going to start pe peeling away layers of different generations with different theologies. And it's very helpful to have a background in the evolution of those theologies and the evolution of how people understood what prayer does and why. Okay, a little bit further, we have phenomenology. That's a long, fancy word, but here we are with graduate level words. Phenomenology just means the study of experience. And this is one which um, <laughs> is kind of important for ritual studies. When you study how people experience prayer, um, it could be very it could be very useful if you're studying a type of prayer which can't easily put into be put into words. If you're an anthropologist and you want to study a type of prayer, phenomenology is important. It's not always the type of study that you could write about. It's usually through experience and through conversation that you could talk about phenomenology. But think about an idea of where this would be useful. Let's say you wanted to study the Kedusha. Right, the kedusha is an angelic communion uh, prayer. It's a prayer where people are praying alongside angels. You cannot uh, effectively write about a tefillah like kedusha unless you've actually experienced it. You cannot write this from the outside in. So, understanding the experience of a tefillah is very important. To um, and the, and uh, and also studying how we pray and how it affects us internally is very important to enriching our tefillah. And lastly, of course, is the academic approach, which is going to be the part two tonight of, of the class. And we're going to discuss, give an overview of the developments of academic research into Jewish liturgy. So it's tempting to first ask ourselves when we when we when we approach a class on tefillah, it's very tempting to start by asking uh, why we pray or how prayers, the prayers that we have came to be. But this skips over a much more important question, which is if you're going to ask all these questions about tefillah, you first have to define it. I want tonight to think about our questions more than our answers, because the questions and asking the right questions can lead you to a much better understanding of your answers and the limitations of your answers. In order to ask good questions and to really understand the tefillah well, we have to define tefillah before we start asking questions about it. This is just a really important step. I, just anecdotally, there's a really funny thing Rabbi Steinsaltz used, uh, liked to say, I love Shalom. He used to say that it's known that the Eskimos have 
a, like a couple of dozen words for snow. They have thick snow, they have thin snow, they have light snow, fluffy snow, wet snow, dry snow. The Eskimos have tons of words for snow. Why? Because that's their lived experience. That's just who they are and how they live. They, they, they have to have a word for every single type of snow. In English, it's just snow. You know, for us, we just have one word, but for them, there's 36 different words for snow. And every culture, Rabbi Steinzel, Rabbi Steinzel says, every culture has something like that, where there's one concept which they just have thoroughly combed. With the Jewish people, he says that word is question. With us, we have a thousand words for the word question. We have the kasha, a shayla, vim, taimar, and we have a percha, a tiyufta, a hakira, skira. We have six million ways of saying a question in Judaism. And it's really important as Jews that we really question tefillah properly and we understand and we get some analytical tools in this introductory introductory shear in order to help us when we move forward. So if we're going to translate simply the word tefillah as prayer, which most of the Targumim do, prayer in English is a very vague word. You can't really say that Prayer is some sort of dialogue between you and God, because unless you're a schizophrenic or magically you're a prophet, you're, God's probably not talking back to you. I mean, between you and me, probably, uh, unless you're hearing voices, this is not a dialogue. It's not a dialogue between you and God. You can neither say that it's a monologue because it does have an experiential quality to it, nor can one say about prayer that prayer is talking to God because prayer isn't always verbal. At best, what you could say in English is that it's like some kind of elemental um, uh, some sort of deliberate encounter between a human and the divine. That's like the most that you could really get when you're trying to, um, give me one second, when you're trying to define tefillah. So welcome to the English language. And in the English language, there's a word for everything. So <laughs> let me just share my screen here. And let me just do this one more time. In the English language, we're going to have a little bit of fun with this. Yeah, we have the screen up. So there is a word for almost every single type of prayer. So let's start. And I know this is boring. I know this is a little bit high schoolish, but please bear with me. We're going to go one by one. We're just going to define the English terms so that we can get all the these the better terms for, for prayer down pat. And therefore, we'll be able to talk about it in a more sophisticated manner. First of all, first one is simple, private prayer. What does private prayer mean? It just means a prayer that you pray to yourself. Sometimes that means something that's fixed, like, I don't know, Asher Yatsar is a private prayer. Sometimes when we'll use the word private prayer, we'll mean Asher Yatsar. And that's perfectly, that qualifies as a private prayer. But also, God, please get me a parking spot. That also qualifies as a private prayer. The next is a meditation. Uh, the, the Some people call this Kavunis or Kavanot. This is usually an addendum to private prayer, and it typically comes along with special meditations to um, make one's prayer more emotional or more meaningful in a mystical sense. The next we'll have is a communal liturgy or a communal prayer. This is very simple. This is prayers that are either done with a community or can only be done with a community. Take a take a take a, a prayer like um, like um like Kaddish or Kadusha or Hazar Sashats. You can't say a prayer like that without a community. And those are designed by communities to be said with a community. Um can everyone see my face or I, I could raise this up here if everyone needs it to. Okay, let's move on. Someone um, needs to be admitted. Someone needs to be admitted. Let me see. I don't see anybody. Okay. Not at the moment. All right. The next the next type is, am I still there? Yes, I'm still there. Is very simple, petitionary prayer. That just means as a fancy word for bakashas, right? Or bakasho, tefilata bakasha. That's the English word for it. Petitionary prayer, asking God for something. The next, penitential prayer. Very similar. It's a child of petitionary prayer. That just means a slicha or a, um, a tachina, where you're asking God for forgiveness. You want to get closer to God. Or you're trying to be a penitent. That's called a penitential prayer. You're also asking God for something but this word is specific, not to be confused with petitionary prayer, penitential prayer is specific to when you're asking God for a um, for some form of forgiveness or, or to get closer to him. Lastly, on this list at least, is intercession. Intercession is a fancy, fancy English word for uh, having an intercessor or having someone in between. So this means you could pray to a an angel, pray to a, a, an ancient, a, a, an ancestor, 
either you're praying directly to that ancestor or that agent um, or that that ancient uh, agent, or you could be um, praying on behalf of that intercessor uh, with, or that that intercessor should intercede for you. That's just part one. Let's keep going. Then you have a Thanksgiving. That's just another way of saying it feels Haida. Maidim is a Thanksgiving. Like kind of neshama is a Thanksgiving. These are tefillahs which just say thank you to God. Next, laudatory prayer. That's the fancy English word for saying tefillah shvach. A, a, um, anything which praises God, that's laudatory prayer. Statutory prayer. Statutory prayer, if you went to law school, you know what statutory means. That means legal prayer. Any prayer which conforms or is emboldened by halacha. So when we say statutory prayer, we mean the things that are required to say to be recited, al pi halacha. So for example, shachas min chamayr, those are statutory prayers. Sometimes the word statutory prayer is used um, among academics to mean like, uh, let's say, hataras nadarim. That's not really a prayer, but it is statutory. So there you go, statutory prayer. Next, a didactic liturgy. That means any liturgy which is meant, a, a liturgy is a set of, of prayers, any liturgy which is meant to um, teach. So that, for, and a good example would be Kriya Satayra. Kriya Satayra is a body of tefillah. It's not really tefillah, but it's a part of the, of the liturgy which is meant to teach. The Azharot is another good example, which are special piyutim or poetic adornments, which teach people halachas. Then we have compensatory prayer, which is just another fancy English word for tefillah tashlumen. If you forget mencha, you forget mayer, and you want to say another uh, another um, another tefillah to compensate for that, that's called compensatory prayer. And lastly, is devotional prayer. Devotional prayer has no tachlis. That's like a shachar vakeshcha from from uh, Shlomo ben Gabirol. This is just a prayer where you're just trying to get close to God. And there are mostly in this genre we have piyutim. And that so much is for all the terminology. So with this terminology, we're not just a little bit more sophisticated in our English. Sarah Spinei Haman, I feel like I'm out of breath. But we also have a little bit more understanding about the problem which is ahead of us. Because once you understand how many types of prayer there are, suddenly you realize that asking the question why we pray is kind of very deficient. Why we ask why we uh, pray petitionary prayer. The answer for why we pray petitionary prayer is very different than the answer for why we have laudatory prayer or for why one would do devotional prayer. And if you're going to ask, well, how did prayer come to be? Well, the answer for how uh, communal liturgies developed is a very different answer than how penitential litur liturgies developed. So it it's very useful to understand the terminology because when you ask, why do we pray? How do we pray? Um, how did prayer come to be? You have to get specific. You have to narrow down your terminology and understand exactly what you're asking. We're, we're Jews. We got to ask better questions. So tonight we're going to graduate. We're going to get to a higher level of understanding here, and we're going to become much better equipped to navigate this field. So the next part here is we're going to, we started off saying that there's five approaches, um, at least five approaches to studying tefillah. The first being halacha. Another way to say this is studying the rabbinics and to study the rabbinic history of tefillah. And this is what I want to start with, because I think it's the one that everybody here is going to be most familiar with. If you're familiar with the Siddur, if you have a background in Orthodox Judaism, you're going to be mostly familiar with the, you're going to be, in my opinion, mostly familiar with the rabbinic background. So let's start with the fa most famous of all, of all rabbinic backgrounds, and that would be the Rambam. The Rambam was famously excellent at systematizing uh, bodies of Jewish law, and in his Sefer Yad the Chazaka or Mishnah Taira, he does a fantastic job of taking the rabbinical approach for discussing prayer and taking the halachic approach for discussing prayer. He discusses three important things, why we pray, what prayer is, and how prayer came to be in that order. So this is actually a fascinating um, uh, exercise in how to write a halachic Sefer. So bear with me here on the Rambam. Um, where am I here on the top? I'm sorry, I have to go back. There we go. Says the Rambam. We're going to read it together. This is on the screen. It is a mitzvah from the Torah to, to pray every day. You have to serve God, Hashem your God. From, yeah, other people might be experiencing freezing. Sorry, I am wired. My connection is wired. I'm not sure why. All right. 
So let's go a little further. Um, we learned from uh, from tradition. How do we know that the word avoda in the pasuk means tefila? Because the pasuk says tefila. What is service of the heart? That means tefila. It's actually Gemara and Tainus. So the Ramam holds that tefillah is, is a deraisa, but the Ramam adds a qualifier here. The ain min tefillah min atayr. However, everything else is derabanan. The ikar chi of of, of tefillah that's deraisa. To pray once a day, okay, one time one time a day. Wake up in the morning, say maidani your yaitze. But ain min yin tefillah min atayr. How many times a day you have to pray? Nope, that's derabanan. The ain mishnah tefillah sayis min atayr. Nor the halachas. The halachas of tefillah also min derabanan. The ain tefillah is man kavua min atayr. Nor do you have nor min atayr do you have a set time for four prayers. And then let's skip the one about Nashim here in the, in the, in the middle, because he's just saying technically women are also Chayavais. So now the Ramam goes into history. How did it, how did it come to be? In the olden days, a person was very good at, at praying by himself with Hebrew. It used to be that people whoever was good at prayer, whoever was prayerful people, would pray whenever they wanted and as much as they wanted. And if you weren't so prayerful or your language of speaking Hebrew wasn't so good, you wouldn't pray as much. People would pray as many times as they wanted during the day. Some would pray one time. Everybody would face the, base of the, the direction of Beis HaMikdash. Okay, I think Verizon lost me there. Everybody can still see me? There we go. All right, sorry, we're back. We had technical difficulties. All righty, so yeah, Verizon must have cut out for a second, and we're back. So, essentially, from most the time of Moshe Benu until the last one of the last prophets, Ezra, um, this was how uh, people would pray. That's the Ramam's history of things. The Ramam says that over time, people got, got thrown into exile and their knowledge of speaking Lashon HaKadosh was greatly diminished. And therefore, the Anshi Knesset Sagadayla came along and canonized and instituted a proper official t- uh, prayer system, right? So he has the first three. The first of uh, Shemayin Esrei became the halachic prayer, um, the 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 main corpus of or body of halachic prayer. You have the first three, says the Ramam, the the first three brachas of Shemayin Esrei, which are brachas of shvach, the middle um, twelve, which are the the uh, brachos of bak- of bakasha, and then the last three, which are the brachos of ha- of hoda. And that's how the Ramam s- says that tefillah works. You have uh, shvach. Uh, Bakasha and then Hoda, and he learns this from a couple of Gemaras. That that is how. Um, am I still sharing my screen? Let's see. And he learns from a couple of Gemaras that that is how the the um, that that is how Tila is structured. Okay, so this is the Rambam's background, and it's very important, but it does suffer from a couple of tiny problems, but they're not the Rambam's fault. First of all. It's the Ramam is limited by his medium. This is a halachic safer, and he cannot speak about or exhaust himself speaking about the minutia of every single tefillah. He only discusses Shemay Nesri here, and it would seem that the Ramam is overgeneralizing or the Ramam is avoiding some major issues. For example, he doesn't discuss why we praise Hashem, why we should thank Hashem. He doesn't discuss any history besides the Shemay Nesri, but it does give him, it does give us. It, this reading this Rambam gives us a perspective into the lens that the Rambam had. His approach to tefillah in general is that, first of all, tefillah has nebulous origins in private prayer, right? Once upon a time, people used to pray on their, pray on their own. And then it received a boost from the Achei Knesset Hagadayla at the end of the, of, of the, right before the, 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 the building of the second base of Mikdash in order to fix the language and to canonize a, a, a single text, a singular text that everybody could say. And this was to boost the, the, um, the practice of prayer to be a normative exercise, a normative religious practice. That's the Rambam's framework. This is very 
very useful because this was a staple, a halachic staple for a very, very long time. It taught people and it taught rabbis that the essence of tefillah is halachic and all of the non-halachic elements of tefillah are less important and they could draw from the main body of halacha. If you want to know, can or can you not say this certain piyat or can or can you not say this bracha with Shem Malchus, you draw from the body of halacha. And this remained the attitude of most of the rabbana, most of the paiskim who approached and studied tefillah throughout the centuries it started here because the Rambam and, and Rav Sadia before him systematized the understanding of tefillah as a halachic body of service to Hashem. And this is the, um, this is the Rambam. So just to give a little bit more of this backdrop uh, among the Rabbanim who studied tefillah, many of the Paiskim say more explicitly than the Rambam. They speak this out that the text of the tefillah, right, the text of Shemayin Esrei, was never fixed. It was only a formula that the Anshei Knesset Hagadayla put down, that there should be 18 brachas, one after the other, that there should be an order. First you do uh, Gevurais, then you do, um, sorry, first you do Avais, then you do Gevurais, then you do Ketushais, then you do uh, Das, right? You had an order of topics. And the Anshei Knesset Hagadayla didn't invent every single one of these brachas. They just set a mandated order and a set schedule for how people should pray Shemayin Esrei. And this allowed later for multiple different versions, multiple different rites to uh, appear and to become their own Nusrais HaTzfila. It wasn't until much later, um, you're talking like the Hasidic Ashkenaz in the 12th century, much later you find there are Rishonim who believe, and they believe strongly, that that the um, that the actual nusach of the tefillah, like every word, every letter, had a specific counting. And the Anshei Knesset Hagadayla planned the tefillah down to the very last letter. And there are gematrias, and there's there's Ramazim, and it was given on Meisha Masinai. That was what the Hasidic Ashkenaz held, but not everybody held that way. The Abu Yerham rejects it completely. He says this is not true. It can't be true. You have so many nusrays all across across Klai Yisrael. How could this ever be true? So, no, so the other approach, uh, the Svardi, more the Svardi approach and the Ashkenaz approach, became that multiple nusrays of tefillah are valid. This finally blossomed into when the Arizal uh, said that there's 12 shrashim or 12 roots of prayer, he was, the Arizal was um, canonizing this, not canonizing, or fixing or giving his stamp that there were 12 roots of prayer and they were all rooted in one of the 12 shvatim and everybody prays according to his nusach because it has its own roots in that nusach of that shebet. So that's a very interesting idea. This is something that came along many, many centuries later, but this is a lot of the rabbinic backdrop of how the Torah world sought tefillah for a very long time. So for many centuries, for most, for most of Jewish history, nobody was intensely focused on the history of tefillah. No one really sat down and said, you know what, where did this bracha come from? Who wrote this bracha? When was it written? How was it written? What was the original nusach? Nobody did a deep historical, philological dive into, into the tefillah. It was really the paiskim who were just interested in, in, in the halacha and the minig. If you look at the Chuvas Hagayinim, you look at the Manig, the Chayim, the Eshkol, the Shbelei Leket, Machsar Vitri, Abu Derham, all of these Sfarim, these were paiskim who were interested in laying down the law, the halacha, the minig, all of those important information about how the tefillah should be conducted, but they were not intensely interested in, let me just admit somebody, but the Paiskim themselves weren't intent, in, intensely interested in the minutia and every single detail of the history of tefillah uh, from every single angle and every, and every single aspect. So let me just move, move the slide here one more. For the event, by the way, I should mention, um, there is also commentary among in the rabbinic field that the commentary was usually added by like Machsar Vitri or Abu Durham, uh, but the earliest commentaries we have is Rehuda ben Yakar, and we also have the Rekeach, the Chassid Ashkenaz. They began commentaries on the Siddur. There is a heavy bent towards the mystical in these commentaries, but that is really the end of the um, rabbinic output. The serious rabbinic output on tefillah ends there. So now we have to move on from studying the rabbinics of tefillah, if you're going to, again, we're, 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 we're going through all the different approaches. We just, to summarize, we just studied, we just studied quickly the rabbinical approach to the, the historic, the history of the rabbinical approach to how you study tefillah. Now let's study for a minute, the, the, the minute or a few minutes, the theological approaches to studying tefillah. And then we'll, we'll just take a break for questions if, if necessary. So the, the weightiest 
questions, let me just admit one more person, the weightiest questions of theology on tefillah are remarkably unimportant. And I'm going to demonstrate to you what I mean. The first problem is called the problem of petitionary prayer, or really just the problem of prayer. This is a famous theological problem. And in order to understand the problem of prayer, and we're not, again, we're not going to spend, if anyone's about to get, if anyone's about to get bored and check out, I promise, we're not going to spend time in answers. We're only going to spend time in questions. We're going to spend time on how to understand the questions, how to divide them, and then we're going to move on. So let's, let's look at all the problems with Tfilos Bakasha, and that'll better equip you when you understand the questions better, you'll understand how limited each one of your answers could be. So let's start with the first. What is an answered prayer? What does it mean for a prayer to be answered? So typically, if you're going to discuss this seriously, you have to think about how can I prove? Well, what could I say is an actual prayer that gets answered? It would have to be something I do not have. God says I shouldn't get it, or maybe I don't deserve it. And then I pray for it and I receive it because of my prayer. It has to be either totally or in part because of my prayer. That would be an answered prayer. And otherwise, you cannot start asking more questions about Philos Bakasha unless you, you maintain that this is what an answered prayer is. It has to be when, when your ask gets fulfilled because you prayed for it, or at least partially because you prayed for it. And this actually leads us to the next problem, which is the epistemology of, of Tfilos Bakasha, meaning the truth, the study of the truth. How in the world can you prove that your tefillah was, was, was what, that your, your request was fulfilled because you asked for it? Maybe you had some other zechus. Maybe God had some other reason. You can never uh, prove without a question, without any doubt that the reason uh, your prayer was answered was because uh, God, um, uh, God accepted your prayer. For example, they, they tried, I think it was in the 70s and in the 90s, they tried doing these studies where they'd have a, a control group and a double blind test of people who were in the hospital. You had people who were prayed for and people who weren't prayed for. And, and nobody serious about theology ever considered this is a real test because you can, never, you can never really judge people, even in groups, even statistically, because some people might have merits or all, all sorts of other considerations for why God might answer their prayers more so than other people. So it's very difficult to pin this down. At best, you could say that we can reasonably assume. Some theologians will say, well, you could reasonably assume that God did it because he was answering their prayers. But more than that, you can't really, you can't really, um, you can't really say. The next problem is, this is uh, getting deep in the weeds, so we're not gonna get into the answers, but this is the problem of immutabil immutability and impassibility. These are important terms to understand. You're not, gonna, you're not gonna have to know this uh, for your daily life, I promise, but it is fun to know. Immutability means something cannot be changed. Impassibility means it cannot be affected by outside sources. So when theologians speak about the Godhead, when they speak about God in his essence, they very often speak about God being immutable, meaning unchangeable, and also impassable. As a consequence, if he's immutable, he's also not able to be changed from outside sources. Now, if you think about these two prerequisites, these two theological prerequisites, how can you ever change God's mind? What is going on? How do we change how God is going to behave to our world? How could we make God interact with us differently? Is it possible that God is immutable and not impassable? Is it possible that he is impassable but not immutable? All of these questions are very thorny. They get deep into the weeds of how God um, exists and how God's actions per pertain to his existence. First order causation, sec second order causation, all sorts of fun theological weeds. Now, this is why the question of the problem of petitionary prayer stands at the nexus of so many theological problems. The next problem you would have is the problem of God's omniscience. This is the fact that God knows the future. This is, is essentially the problem of God's foreknowledge. God knows everything. So if God knows everything and he knows what's going to happen tomorrow, what does it help if I'm going to pray? He knows whether or not I'm going to get this tomorrow. He knows whether or not I'm deserving. So this is essentially the problem of foreknowledge. If God knows the future, what does it help if I pray? This is extensively dealt with in theology. This is the problem of free will, free will, the problem of determinism. And somehow, if you're going to have a resolution between whether or not your resolution is soft or hard determinism, your resolution is, is free will, whatever, whatever theodicy or, or system you pick up for your theological 
building of Judaism, you're going to have to incorporate pray, incorporate prayer somewhere in there and to each their own. But that that's that's fundamentally one of those problems. The next puzzle would be moral perfection. And this is uh, the easiest one to understand, which is that God is good in everything he does, right? We, we believe that God is morally perfect and he is perfectly benevolent. So that has a problem. If God is perfectly good, then he's going to do what's best for me anyway. Why in the world do I need to ask God for things? If it's best for me to get to have Parnassa tomorrow, Hashem's going to give me Parnassa. If it's not best for me to have Parnassa, well, he's not going to give me Parnassa. Why, why in the world should I be praying? It doesn't help. It doesn't make any sense. So some would argue, of course, just, just not to leave you hanging, some would argue that it's not, not to let us get spoiled, that God put it into the mechanism of the universe that we would have to interact with God. He wants us to have a relationship with him, or he doesn't want us to get spoiled, and he wants us to ask for these things first. Um, and that is so much for the problems of petitionary prayer. As you can see, the answers that'll give you answers for some won't give you answers for others, and you're always going to get in the thick of it for how Tfilis Bakasha works. And we're going to touch on this for in, in a minute. I'm, I'm sorry to go full beast mode, but let's just keep going a little bit just so that we can just so that we can cover all the theological problems and we will uh, and then we'll discuss we'll discuss the theology in general. So this is laudatory prayer. The next slide, in case you're listening on the podcast, the next slide here is about laudatory prayer, which is really halal bitishbachis, anytime you're praising God. So the question of it's the question of praising God is really not not a simple matter. If you first ask yourself to define praise, it usually means if you're going to define just define the word, it means that you're trying to describe or portray an object in a very positive manner. So in that very definition of the word laudatory of the words laudatory prayer or in the word shvach, you realize that inextricable from shvach is description. It's part of its definition. You're describing something. You're portraying something. And therefore, this comes to the first problem of laudatory prayer, which is that it clashes with, with what's known as apophatic theology. Apophatic theology is a very fancy word for negation theology or for, for the idea that you could only speak of God in negative terms. Throughout Jewish history, we had some theologians like the Rambam who were extreme um, apophatic theologians. And the Rambam has a brilliant way of, of uh, attacking this problem in Mary Nebuchim. And again, Mary Nebuchim is a, a large topic, but in the first, in the first chapter, he, he's very sensitive to religious language and how we interpret words in the Torah. So the Rambam there is very sensitive for how we describe God. The Rambam there makes a famous distinction. Some people will call it the is-does distinction which is essentially, we can only speak of God in terms of what he does, not in terms of what he is. So therefore, God's essence, what God is, it's completely, utterly unknowable. The only relationship we have to God is his actions, how he seems to interact or how God's actions seem to affect our world. So we can only describe God's actions. We can never describe God's um, essence. And he gives a very interesting mushal. I think this is in actually in Parak Bays. He says, think about a fire, right? You've got a fire and the fire can soften wax. A fire can blacken paper. But does that mean that fire is soft? Does that mean that fire is black? Does that mean that, you know, that the fire is, is, is intrinsically one of those effects? Uh, no, that's not how fire works. Fire is distinct from the effects that it has on other objects. In the same vein, the Rambam says, when we understand Hashem, we could only think about or try to attain any relationship to his actions, but never can we try to describe his essence. And the Rambam brings a very famous Gemara about this very topic. And this Gemara discusses the tefillah, the first bracha in Shemayin Esrei, which is Hakel um, Agadol So there was a famous story, the Gemara says, where a person came to go pray as the chazan in front of the kahal when Rabbi Hanina was um, present. And the chazan gets up and he says, Right, God, the great, mighty, awesome, powerful, mighty, awe-inspiring, strong, fearless, steadfast, and honored God. Hint in the Siam. Rabbi Hanina was um, a little sardonic, but patient. And he waits until he finishes. And when he finishes, he says, well, uh, have you concluded all the prayers, the, the praises of God? In other words, he was asking him sarcastically or sardonically, why do you need to ask so many pra praises? We only have 
these three, Hakela Gadol Gibor, uh, sorry, Gadol Gibor Vanaira, we know those from Maish Rabbeinu. Maish Rabbeinu described God in those terms. And the Anshik Knesset Sakadayla said that we have to put those in tefillah. And had they not said these things, we would never say such things. In other words, only the prophets who had an intimate connection with God could describe his actions in some way. They could say that he is Gadol, Gibar, Vahanaira. They could give some sort of description of God. But we who have no relationship to that, we should have no business uh, praising God um, in any other way. So the Ramam uses this as as a as a basis for saying, and he uses the pasuk intilim lechadu miatila that when it comes to God, uh, to him silence is praise, and meaning that essentially you can't really say anything. There's really nothing we could say uh, definitively about God, and essentially silence would be better. However, a religion of silence is not really a religion at all. People just can't do that, and therefore. The Ramam understands that there must be some uh, there must be some leeway for um, saying praise to God, but it has to be in a very limited amount. And most people don't even understand how extreme the Ramam is in his apophatic theology. For example, you might not be able to say, "Well, God is powerful, so you can't say that." So you must say, uh, "God is not lacking in power." Right? So God is not lacking power. That's the negative way of saying it. But in English, that kind of mistranslates it because a double negative in English connotes a positive. If you say if you say God is not lacking in power, it means that God is powerful. But if the Ramam would say God is not lacking in power, it would mean that God is not lacking in power, nor does he possess anything comparable to power. So if 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 God can, uh, if you want to know, can God move this house? Sure, God can move the house, but that's not because he is powerful, it's because he ha- he created the universe and he's capable of moving the house. It's not comparable in any way to the power that you might understand. So the Ramam is extremely strict in this apophatic theology. And this comes to the next thing, which is halachic concerns. When we get to laudatory prayer, there is a body of halacha built around this Ramam and Moira, which is incredible. Never before do you have a, a, a work of religious philosophy quoted in the Paiskim. The Paiskim bring the Ramam. And they want to limit severely any ability for us to praise God. However, they know, of course, that a religion of silence is no religion at all. So they find very many loopholes with this Gemara that the Ramam doesn't say explicitly. There's a lot of loopholes. First of all, the first bracha of Shemayin Esrei is not any bakasha. There's no, there's no embellished praise. It's just specifically describing God. You're confronting God. You're saying hakel. And you say, gadol gibar vanaira. So when it comes to describing God directly, then you can only use those three. But if you're going to be uh, praising God with a story, you're going to say God took us out of, of, of Egypt, or you're just praying privately, you're praying to yourself. Um, and, or you, if you were saying something outside of Shemayin Esrei, or you said a, a tefillah shvach with the language of Pesukim from Tehillim, all of that is mutter. So the Pais can find a thousand loopholes for saying tefillah shvach. It's funny that that even if you look in the Beis Yasef, he brings Keter Malchus from Gabi Rol. He's like, look, <laughs> Gabi Rol wrote a million uh, is in, in Keter Malchus, so we can do. And so much for the halakhic concerns. Next, the next problem of laudatory prayer is divine perfection. So I hope everyone's bearing with me now, but this is advanced. We're going we're gonna to get a little advanced. Divine perfection is the problem that God doesn't need praise. This, is the, this sounds advanced, but honestly, it's one of the most simple parts. Everybody agrees God does not need our praise. If God is divinely perfect, if he's not lacking in anything, he doesn't need praise. So what in effect are we accomplishing by praising him? What, what does it do? What, why are we doing it? So there's two, honestly, only two, not only, but mostly two routes to take. One route you're going to take is that it, praising God has absolutely no effect. And its utility is only, the utility of, of praying is only for the worshiper. It's just instrumental. It's, it's instrumentalism. People need this. People need to praise God. And therefore, it has utility for worshipers that they could worship God. And there's no, there's really no other uh, effect that it has. And then the other vein you could take is that, well, yes, it might have that utility, but also or and or it does have some for, sort, sort of effect. There might be some form of chen, some form of grace that comes down from Shemayim. There might be some form of schar that a person gets for shvach. So that would be more of a mystical lean, but um, those would be the two sides of the coin. You could say that either uh, shvach of Hashem is really just utilitarian, um, or you could say that it actually has some form of effect. And both could be true as well. Now, why is this important? 
This last one is exceptionally important because this covers for us, these two answers are also applicable to Thanksgiving. When it comes to thanking God and we say, hey, thank you, and we're not actually praising God, we're just saying, or you're saying, uh, these same two answers can also cover um, why we would thank God, either because, well, we just need it, we're just human, and that's how we worship, or otherwise you could say that God gives us some sort of schar, Hashem gives us some sort of schar for praising him. One last reason you could possibly come up with is, is Rabbeinu Bachia and Chavis Halavas. He actually says that, that gratitude is quintessential to Yiddishkeit entirely. And he gives criteria for it. He says there's intent, there's reach, there's different ways of, of gauging how much gratitude you have. But if gratitude is quintessential to Judaism, then praising God would be just built in. So now to summarize, we just spent a lot of boring, <laughs> a lot of high level stuff on Jewish theology. But to summarize, the answers... This is why this is all in the introduction class. The answers to these questions do not directly affect how meaningful prayer is to us. It doesn't either translate the experience of prayer into words. Most people are going to pray whether or not God, um, whether or not God is going to accept their prayer. Even if they knew there's a 95% chance that prayer didn't work or that Hashem wouldn't accept their prayer, most people are going to pray anyway. And so the, the answers to these questions aren't very critical to our experience of prayer or to how meaningful prayer is. This, the, the understanding of the theology of prayer is much more useful to understanding when we dissect the tefillah and we see who wrote it, when we see when it was written and we see the attitudes of people who wrote it, we start to learn what their attitudes were towards theology. And sometimes that helps you actually place them when you see their attitude towards Mashiach, when you see their attitude towards Slicha, when you see their attitude towards Bakasha, when you identify these elements in tefillah, it can get really important. Now, we can't, with volumes of information, we can't, with with, with volumes of theology, we're not going to make your, meaning, your, your tefillah more meaningful to you. And that brings us to the next part, phenomenology. You can't, we cannot discuss with a textbook the experience of davening. There's no way that the experience of having a, a, a communique with the divine, it's some sort of dialogue or encounter with the divine, is ever going to be enriched from an introductory class to tefillah. That's just not going to happen. It's only, I think we're, we're getting close to running out of time, but it's only the, the act of praying in, in and of itself and discussion, conversation, and direct experience, which is helpful for studying the phenomenology and the study of experience for prayer. Okay, so I wish we could stop for questions here, but we're so close to running out of an hour that, well, how much time, does anyone know how much time we've spent so far? Probably almost 45 minutes at least. So, I would love to stop for questions, but I think we need to move forward just to, to cover the first, the, the, just to really finish the introduction as it needs to be finished. So let's move on to the academics. Let's move on to the history of the research of tefillah. So the, I'm going to move a little quickly because I'm sure that um, this part is going to be mostly interesting to students or scholars of the field. Anybody wants a head start, listen now, listen fast. The academic field of Jewish liturgy is not really a field in and of itself. It's really a subset of the field of study of rabbinic Judaism. And you need a strong background in rabbinics, but in order to study this field, you're also going to need to have a proficiency in a bunch of disciplines. In the 19th century, the 20th century, really, the, the scholars began to realize that this is really a multidisciplinary field. First of all, you're going to need a background in archaeology because a lot of the work that comes out of the Qumran and the Dead Sea Scrolls is very useful for understanding the language and the, uh, the culture of the Second Temple period, meaning Zman Bayashani. Therefore, having a background in how, how, in how to research archaeology can be very useful in understanding early prayer. Next is history. You have to understand migration period patterns. You have to understand when Jews were where and why, what languages they spoke. You're going to have to have a firm background in Jewish history. Anthropology and ritual studies, you're going to need to understand, have some working knowledge of how that stuff kind of works and the, and the various uh, different schools of anthropology in order to understand how certain prayers have been, uh, have been, have developed, like take something like Kol Nidre, which is absurd that it should be, have become so popular, but it became popular anyway. Anthropology will help for that. Philology, this again, for people who are listening who are not academic, philology means that you're studying a text 
um, with you're studying literature or a text with an eye towards language. You're looking very precisely at the language and at the layers of the words of the text, and you're going to compare it to other texts to find the most original form. So this is something that a lot of classical scholars will do. They're going to take out uh, Aristotle or Plato, look at all the different manuscripts and say what the original text was. Lastly, bibliography. This is the study of books and this is and, and the history of books and when they were written and the recensions. This is very useful for a background in bibliography and how to follow bibliographers because they're very smart and hard to deal with sometimes. Um, bibliographer, bibliography is a great proficiency to have if you're going to study tefillah because you have to track down Sidurim very often. So let's get into the first um, the first academic forays into studying tefillah. We're going to get through the history very quickly. The first forays began in the late 1700s with the pursuit of finding the most perfect siddur. This was really a rabbinic pursuit. There was a person named Rabbi Wolf Heidenheim and his, his disciple or really his successor, Seligman Bayer, uh, Bauer, I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce his name. He wrote the siddur of Eidus Yisrael and Wolf Heidenheim wrote uh, before it was Avedis Israel, he wrote the Rodelheim Sitter. This became like the the this became like the art scroll in 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 Germany. This was a precise sitter. They used the methods of philology that were being developed at the time. And they used all the data available to them to to create a very precise sitter with an exceptional commentary and an exceptional back historical background. This was some of the first and and namely orthodox research into the study of the history of tefillah. And this was really groundbreaking work. The, it, before this was basically how, how we had it at that time. It was either you're going to, in the rabbinics, you were either going to write a lacha sefer or you're going to write a sitter. That was basically, <laughs> this was the type of um, uh, tefillah, uh, Jewish liturgy research that was going to be done. Next thing we have is just to, to give you background is the Wissenschaft des Judentum. So this is a, a period of history that you need to know about. And again, if you're, if you're new to this, the Wissenschaft, which Wissenschaft des Judentum, which I don't really know how to pronounce so well because um, German is not my first language or my fifth. Basically, the Wissenschaft was a movement in the early 19th century Germany. What happened is, is that in the early 19th century, this is a picture of Berlin in the late 19th century, but you got the idea. In the early 19th century, the early 1800s, and even at the end of like the 1700s, a lot of the Jewish intellectuals felt a huge inferiority complex. They were in a time of radical change. You had the industrial revolution was occurring. You had science, innovation, progress, modernity, philosophy. It was an incredible time and an incredible amount of change was happening. And most of it was among Anglo-Saxon white men who were Christian or German, uh, German white men, British white men, a lot of this huge scientific change and a lot of the huge philosophy was happening among, Christ, among Christian white men. And they felt very inferior. Some of these Jewish intellectuals just converted to, to Christianity because they wanted to be in with the crowd. And some of them went ahead and decided they were going to promote Judaism to become just as good as good of an alternative to Christianity as, <laughs> as could be. They, they wanted to feel like they're part of the crowd. No, we're Germans too. We're part of this German culture and we can progress Germany. We can progress the German people in our own way. And Judaism is just as valid. Judaism has to be respected. And maybe it's a little bit lame. Maybe we dive in three times a day and we put on full and we shake and we have talus and, and, we, and we, we have all these boring rituals and these archaic stuff. But you know what? Maybe we'll refresh it. Maybe we'll, we'll reform it. And therefore, they started one of the components of the reform or progressive movement, even before it was officially called the reform, was the Wissenschaft. This was started by a couple of scholars. Here's one of their first journals. This was uh, academic studies of, of, of rabbinics, of, of uh, rabbinic studies. They were going to study Judaism academically, just like every other religion got studied academically. We're going to study it properly with the new tools of philology and of historical research and archaeology. We're going to study Judaism properly. This was very polarizing for Jewish people because some people felt like this was a rejection of tradition. What do you mean? If my grandfather says that the Rambam wrote Yigdal, then the Rambam wrote Yigdal. Um, you know, th the tradition was paramount to many people. So they saw this as a rejection of tradition. Some people saw this as just another form of heresy that you would you would uh, prioritize science over Torah or that you would, some, some people saw this as like uh, a, a lot of the scholars were very, um, they would humanize the Rishonim. So there, there are so many, there are so many layers to this, but it was polarizing. And there were people on the Orthodox, on, on the right, people on the left, people on both sides who were very passionate about, uh, about the Wissenschaft. However, this movement, this academic movement gave birth to 
serious study of tefillah, and we're, we owe a debt of gratitude to, to um, the first scholars in this field. First, we have rabbi slash non-rabbi Yom Tev Zunz, Leopold Zunz. He was one of the, he's such a character. You want to look into him. He was an amazing character. He was one of the first reformers, one of the founders of the Wissenschaft. He, and he was trained under two famous philolo uh, philologists, uh, German philologists. His, one of them was named Friedrich, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I have to pull up his name because I don't remember, uh, Friedrich Wolf and August Bach. And their method of philology assumed that there's an Ur text, that there's an original text that you have to peel back. The simplest version of the text is usually the most original or the most correct. And therefore, um, we can use these tools of philology to peel back layers and to arrive at what the original text was. He did this, uh, his teachers did this with Homer. So he figured, I'm going to take these tools I learned in university and, and I'm going to apply them to, um, uh, to tefillah and I'm going to apply them to Jewish studies. It's fascinating that, I mean, in this picture, he doesn't look so religious, but he was like ardently for wearing tefillah and he, wa he, would, <laughs> he would lead the services. He, he thought he, we were going to he was going to reform the synagogue. He built his own synagogue with, they, 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 um, they, they said the prayers in German. He brought in an organ. He actually didn't even get shut down by Jews. He got shut down by the Christians because the Christians were afraid that his synagogue was going to be so attractive. It was going to bring converts away from, from Christianity. So that's Leopold Zunz, fascinating character. Look into him. He's the father of Jewish liturgical research. Here I have, let me just show you a picture. Of, uh, this is a Hebrew translation of, let me stop my share so I could show it in the, in the big screen. This is a Hebrew translation of, of, Leip, of Yom Tov Zunz's um, work on Minhagi Tfilo Piyot Bikile Sisrael. He published only in German academically, and he um, did a lot of very important foundational work in, on Tfila and we're indebted to him until today. He was the first to notice that Tfila uh, developed gradually, that the Jewish liturgy evolved over time and there were different components added one by one. And this was one of the most important uh, ground, one of the, the most important uh, philological groundbreaking uh, foundational work that he's, he began. Next was Ismar Elbogen or Bitzchak Elbogen. He was more reformed than, than Sun's but he refined Sunz's method. He did. He had more precise methods of philology, and he, lucky, more lucky than Sunz, had access to the Cairo Geniza. He lived during the time when Solomon Schechter brought all the, the, the treasure back from, from Egypt. So he wanted to refine Sunz's work by bringing so much more evidence from Egypt. And he published a book called, uh, I don't know how to say it in German, but I'll, I'll show you here on my screen. This is called the uh, Jewish Liturgy, a comprehensive history. It was published in first in German and then in Hebrew in the 70s and then in English in the 90s, I believe. This book is the most thorough academic textbook on Jewish prayer. He is uh, an incredible scholar, just like Sons, just absolutely titanic amounts of scholarship. They they were huge and tremendous scholars in their fields. And he, he develops the philological approach because is that how you say that? Philology? Philological? I guess that's how you say it. So he, he developed this approach and went a little further. What he's basically doing is he's showing with more evidence that philology isn't always enough. You can't always assume that there's an or text, that there's an original text. Elbogen threw that away. That can't be. It can't be. Certain tefillas, it must have been that there was a, originally variations on the text. Different people said different things, and eventually they either homogenized or one survived and the other didn't. He pushed further than Zunz did, and his work is so foundational and important that it's still used today. You can, I mean, it's important to pull out um, the, the, modern, the, the modern version of it. Raymond Scheinlin updated it. So there is like brackets for every time Elbogen was wrong or every time Elbogen was right. And honestly, it's very useful. If you're, if you're getting into this, this field, that's one of the core textbooks you need to have because uh, he's right more, a scary amount of times. He's right just with his intuition. But very often he's wrong, just he, he didn't have the data. So let's move a little further and go on in the history with Daniel Goldschmidt and Yosef, Yosef Heinemann. Both Orthodox, both of them from, they were both born in Germany and they fled because of the Nazis. So let's start with Rabbi Daniel Goldschmidt. Rabbi Daniel Goldschmidt was a huge Talmud Chacham, probably had a photographic memory. And he, got a, he went to university in Berlin to get a degree in classical philology, okay? This is his background, uh, peeling apart the classics from, from the Greeks and from the Romans, 
peeling apart those texts and coming to um, better understanding using language, using recensions, using manuscripts, peeling away the original text. That was his training. Then the Shokin Publishing House reaches out to him, like, hey, you're a Talmud Chacham and you're pretty smart. Why don't you make a Haggadah Shal Pesach? And he's like, oh, okay, fine. So he, he published a Haggadah Shal Pesach in German, did a fantastic academic job. And suddenly everybody in the liturgy field was like, hey, you know, can you do more of this? And so he's like, oh, okay. And Rabbi Daniel Goldschmidt became inadvertently the giant of the field of Jewish liturgy and published some incredibly valuable works, his machzairim, his, his, his research, uh, so many things were, that were so valuable. He moved past Sons and Elbogen. He went a little bit further in method, and he was the first to notice that, you know, philology and even theory sometimes is not enough. You have to get a little bit more sophisticated. You have you have to um, account for much more uh, variation, and there's and sometimes even social context. You have to get a little bit out of touch. You have to figure out where things are said and why. He was one of the first people to start realizing this that this was important. Um, but then again, he was kicked out of, of Germany. He lost his post as librarian of the University of, of the Library of of, German, of Berlin. He lost his post because the Nazis said Jews weren't allowed of any posts. So he moved, I think, to Eretz Yisrael, and he continued his work there. Next, you have Rabbi Yosef Heinemann, also born in Germany, moved to, he, he's, uh, he had a smicha from the Mir Yeshiva, and he also went to university. I don't remember what he studied, but he left because of the Nazis. He went to London, and then finally he went to Eretz Yisrael. He was a genius of geniuses, but what he found, and he was building on somebody else's work, somebody named Arthur Spanier. Um, he found that he didn't think philology was enough, and he also thought it was usually the wrong tool. He said, Bishlama, you could use philology, you could, you could use this, the, the, the study of the text when it comes to piot. Take a, po a poem, Th there's one author, it's a literary text, and there was an original version, right? Everyone could agree with that uh, when it comes to piot. But when it comes to tefillah, no such thing ever happened. Rabbi Yosef Heinemann threw that out the window. No, there was never ever such a thing as one original text. There were multiple social circles in Eretz Yisrael. People developed their own ways of praying, whether it was rabbinic or Qumrani or all sorts of sects. And within, even within the rab rabbinic sects, sects of Judaism, there were multiple different versions. And then um, by coincidence, certain texts overlapped, certain texts homogenized, certain ones became the most popular. And it's much more important to look at the Sitzim Leben, the, 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 the context in time and in life of when these prayers were, uh, when, when these prayers were, uh, how do I say this, uh, how and when these prayers were composed, then to look at and to, to fruitlessly look for an original text. There never was an original text. There was never an original Shemayin Esrei. There was never, never an original Yetzir R. There was never an original version of any bracha. No, you have to look at the context and you have to start looking at typologies. What type of prayer is this? Is this a communal prayer? Is this a Beis HaMikdash prayer? Is this a Karban prayer? Is this a prayer which is said for Berchus HaMazayin? You have to start um, sorting things into types and categories and into social contexts rather than starting to look for original texts. This became a very, very popular method. Later scholars um, appreciated this a lot. And a lot of them said, yeah, you know, you're probably right. There probably was no original text. So one of the great scholars of this was Louis Finkelstein. He was famously a conservative rabbi, but in his private life, he was a little bit more orthodox. And he didn't really, he, I'm mentioning him because he, he has such a huge output. He, he does like the philological approach. That's ma mainly his, his style, but he, appreciate, he appreciates Heinemann's contributions. He had such a humongous output in his time. He, he put out so many huge articles and so many important works of liturgy. I have to mention him uh, just because we're, we're, we're there chronologically, but he's really important because of how wrong he often is. He's an incredible scholar. He knows so much, but his methods are so deeply flawed so often that he often makes so many important mistakes that he's really important to know about because so many of his mistakes are so important. And he'll bring in new information, but the way he interprets it is not always so great. So much for Louis Finkelstein. We're going to have some fun with him as we go on with our Tefillah class. Next, you have Ezra Fleischer. Ezra Fleischer, to say he's a tower of Piot is, 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 a, is basically doing him a disservice. When it comes to study of Hebrew liturgical poetry, he's a skyscraper. He was so far and above 
anybody else, when if you would read any of his research, any of his papers, any of his books, you, you, you're talking to a computer with a, a uh, what do they call it? A carbon-based computer. The man was an unbelievable scholar of scholars. Why am I mentioning a scholar of Piot? Because at the end of his life, he got involved in the liturgy scene. And he published a series of papers where he refuted Heinemann. And he went ahead and said, and this is a guy who's not so religious. He went ahead and said, Heinemann's wrong. No, there was an original text. Rabban Gamliel Biyavne did create an original text of the tefillah, just like all of you know the, the typical Orthodox view that many people have naively, that there was one original text and it just got corrupted over the time. That's what Ezra Fleischer started arguing. And he started arguing that that anytime you find a variation in the original text, it's only because later Pythonim got lazy and embellished and adulterated and, and damaged the text. But originally, when Rabbi Gamliel composed the brachas under the, the rabbinical assembly in Yavne, he composed an exact formula for the brachas, an exact formula for Shemin Esrei, an exact formula for Yetzir R, and for any important tefillah. This was his position. And it caused a fight. Um, it caused a huge fight. The problem was that everybody in Eretz was terrified. Like, what is this? Is, you know, argue with Ezra Fleischer? Like, you, who are you? You know what I mean? Like, it, it, no, no, everyone was terrified to to uh, to argue with him within Eretz Yisrael. But outside of Eretz Yisrael, that's where things started getting a little bit testy. The American scholars said, uh, "Hello, uh, probably not," and they showed how many of Fleischer's rayas were not good rayas, and they their approach was, it's more complicated than that. You cannot maintain that there was an or text. Or text is a German word. I'm sorry if I didn't say that previously. You cannot maintain that there was an original text. Things are complicated. We have to use a mixture of methods. We have to use phil philology. We're going to have to use archaeology. We're going to have to use for the form critical method, which is what Joseph Heinemann said. You have to look at the form. We have to use the form critical method. We have to use the philological method. We're gonna have to use archeology. span We're gonna have to use anthropology. And they decided they were gonna move this field forward with a much more nuanced view, a much more multidisciplinary approach to studying tefillah. And this was their, uh, this was uh, effectively their contribution. Most, most notably, these three scholars that I have on the screen, uh, Stefan Reif, Ruth Langer, and Lawrence Hoffman, who are all still alive, their work um, is exceptionally important when it comes to medieval um, tefillah, because so many of the early uh, foundational work that was done on tefillah was done for the period before the medieval times, trying to dissect how the tefillahs came to be in the time of the Mishnah, Tanoim, Ameiroim, Saveiroim, pre um, basically that, that era and also pre-Second Temple period. They're like, hey, what happened to medieval tefillah? What happened to how people used to pray in the 1300s? Why is nobody studying that? So that was their field. That's where they entered. And a lot of their output is in that uh, domain. And God willing, we're going to see it as we get there. So thank you, everybody, for this incredible uh, amount of attention you've given me. I'm sorry that it's gone so long. This was a hopefully a graduate level or a, a, a I don't mean that like in a college sense, but a graduated level for an introduction to tefillah. If one wants to study tefillah seriously, if one wants to understand tefillah properly, this is where one has to begin. And um, these are the tools that we're going to be using as we go through the Siddur. We're going to be using the tools and the, the questions and some of the answers of this foundational work in this introductory in this introductory class in order to approach its fila. We're not going to be able to cover every single method. We're not going to be able to, to cover every single every single problem or every single pattern. But as we move on through the tefillahs, we're going to start noticing things. We're going to start picking up uh, different techniques, different methods, different ideas. And as we move through the tefillah, God willing, we are going to come away with a fuller picture. So before we go, does anybody have any questions? I'm it was so long. I don't know if anybody has any time to, uh, to write things down. How many credits do I get for this semester? How many credits? <laughs> Negative 10. Uh. <laughs> you got this, then. Thank you, Sarah Leanne. Thank you, uh, Carlito. The next Shi'or will, then when is the next session? The next Shi'or will, God willing, be next Tuesday, unless, is there a holiday? Is there something happening? I think next Tuesday is free. I'm free. We're going to be continuing next Tuesday, Bezat Hashem.